Hello and welcome to News Round, a recap of stories that made headlines during the week. First of all, let's get the headlines. As campaigns officially commence for the 2023 general elections, presidential candidates sign a peace accord agreeing to run an issue-based campaign. And the Senate rejects bills seeking to legalize the rotation of power among the six geopolitical zones in the country. The Central Bank of Nigeria raises the monetary policy rates with measures interest rate to 15.5% from 14%. Plus, Hurricane Ian threatens the Carolinas after battering Florida. And that's News Round and View. We'll begin our news round in the nation's capital where presidential candidates of the 18 political parties gathered at the International Conference Center to sign a peace accord agreeing to run an issue-based campaign devoid of personal attacks. One of the frontline candidates and presidential flag bearer of the All Progressives Congress, Chief Bola Tinubu, was absent. During the signing, supervised by the National Peace Committee, the Chairman General Abdul Salami Abubakar warned that disinformation is already creating a toxic environment and asks politicians to caution their followers. The Chairman of the National Peace Committee, General Abdul Salami Abubakar, and other prominent members of the committee, including the Sultan of Sokoto, the convener, Bishop Hassan Kuka, arrived at the International Conference Center in Abuja for the signing of the first peace accord for the 2023 general elections by political parties, chairmen and their presidential candidates. The National Peace Committee first initiated the signing of a peace accord in 2015 and also in 2019 to make political parties and their candidates commit to a peaceful general elections. As the countdown to the 2023 general elections begins with the campaigns, the National Peace Committee is rallying all 18 presidential candidates and their party chairmen to commit to issue-based campaigns devoid of fake news and disinformation, which they say is already a threat to the 2023 general elections. Fake news and misinformation continue to pose a significant threat to 2023 uh, general elections. We are calling on politicians to address issues that are fundamental to the Nigerian citizens. The Independent National Electoral Commission will vigorously monitor compliance to ensure that parties shun abusive, intemperate, or slanderous language likely to provoke a breach of the peace during the electionary campaigns. In separate recorded messages, both President Buhari and former President Goodluck Jonathan urged politicians to raise the bar for a peaceful electioneering process in Nigeria. I feel to the contestants, especially their publicity agents and media advisors, to shun personal attacks and to commit to issue based campaigns and political rallies. In 2023, expecting our country to raise the bar of credible and transparent elections and ensuring that our electoral process are peaceful, free, and fair. However, the Inspector General of Police warns against the deployment of personal or state owned security outfits for the campaigns and on the day of the elections. There are currently not less than 88 different quasi sub national security outfits established by state governments, local governments, as well as other non state regulated pseudo security outfits across the country under various nomenclatures. Any attempt, therefore, by any political actor at any level to form or deploy such outfits to advance partisan interests will amount to an offense punishable under the Electoral Act. Presidential candidates from the 18 political parties and their chairman then take turns to sign the peace accord, 
symbolizing their consent to a peaceful electioneering process. National Rescue Movement. While the signing of the peace accord is quite significant in the electioneering process, the onus now rests on the candidates and their supporters who are expected to implement the spirit and letter of the signed document. We think about Nigeria first because we are all Nigerians and that we ensure that it's an issue-based campaign. At least one person must lead at the end of the day, so there's no point creating violence among ourselves just because of election. It's barely five months to the general elections in 2023, and how this exercise turns out will, to a large extent, depend on the conducts of politicians and their supporters. And power rotation remains an unresolved issue in Nigeria's political lexicon. The Senate, in its sitting, has revisited the idea of power rotation among the geopolitical uh, zones of the country, but the debate was inconclusive. The bill, sponsored by Senator Abba Moro of Benue South, had earlier passed the first reading, while some senators argue that it will bring about unity and a sense of belonging for all, especially ethnic minorities. Others say it will go against the nation's constitution. SB 1053, first reading taken. The Red Chamber of the National Assembly comes alive as senators reconvene for plenary. On this very vital national issue... As the senators get down to business, Senator Abamuro is called on to lead the debate on his bill, which is up for second reading. In Nigeria, a multi-ethnic and diverse nation, the need to alternate power across the zones and governorship among the senatorial districts of the country cannot be overemphasized. This is because power rotation can be a veritable tool for our national integration unity, inclusion, peace, and political stability. However, some senators vehemently kick against the bill, which makes Senator Abamuro hurriedly withdraw the bill through Order 42 of the Senate Standing Rules. See, Mr. President, we don't need to codify it. Why are we waiting to codify this into law? Charity begins at home. Why are we waiting to codify this into law? Why don't we do, do what is right? Why don't we do what is needful? Having, the North having had power for eight years, power should come to the South. So they should tell uh, uh, their presidential candidate to step up from the race. No matter how we try to allow our sentiments to drive our desire for a very united, equitable country, we equally have a responsibility to balance that with the oath of office we have taken as senators of the Federal Republic of Nigeria i.e. to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And where the Constitution specifically has prescribed the requirement for emerging into each of the offices created by the Constitution, it may be very, very difficult for this Senate to, by way of legislation, upset that provision of the Constitution. After plenary, the Senate Committee on the Independent National Electoral Commission screened the 19 nominees sent by the President as resident electoral commissioners. However, the nominees from Sokoto, Eboyin, Imo, and Benue states have petitions against their nominations. There is no way state government would have suspended me, come back and take me and begin to give me these positions, making waves, piecing record is everywhere. I never was suspended. I'm not a member of any political party. I have never been a member of any political party. This is just one of these uh, fake and uh, fabricated and false uh, uh, petition which is aimed at possibly uh, at, at tarnishing my image and possibly uh, seeking to prevent the distinguished senators 
from approving my nomination. Today, the Senate passed an amendment to the Court of Appeal Act, and in this new act, there's a provision to increase the number of judges from 90 to 110. Delia Moyeni, Channels Television News. And to the lingering acid strike action, the leadership of the House of Representatives has stepped up its efforts to end the strike with another meeting with the Academic Staff Union and government representatives. The Speaker of the House informed ASU that the White Paper on Revitalization Fund has been received and is awaiting the President's, president's approval. Also, the head of service of the Federation raised concerns over what she described as rampant employment in universities, which she says is a burden for the government, which has been borrowing to pay salaries. The leadership of the House of Representatives met with concerned parties regarding the ASU strike with a view to ensuring that students in tertiary institutions resume academic activities as soon as possible. One of the issues in contention is the payment system for universities. Is there any country in the world where salaries for lecturers are paid from the Office of Academic General? Why is the idea of the law? Let me be short to Nigeria. Are they using the Central Bank? Are they not peculiar? They don't have law. Are they using it neither? You see, one of the risks in thinking of even adopting new tests is that if you do this, you are going to create a room for everybody to now come to say, you know what, we are also unique. Give us our own. Mr. Speaker, as we speak now in the university environment, we already have to. There are three applications. If the end of the test says that the test on U3PS is the superior one, government should adopt that one. We are vehemently opposed to multiple applications because all that it will do is, you know, worsen uh, already bad fiscal situation. As far as university payment is concerned, the three solutions have failed our test because that is what we tested. Okay. Estimating progresses, a comment from the Minister of Labor, leads to a slightly rowdy session. Mr. Speaker, it's jocular, but it's still serious. That what? That the also president said that APC government are kept children at home and that Nigerian people should vote out people who are not children. No, it is. Yeah. No, it is. What did he say? Yeah. But, but, you are here. But, <laughs> we're making progress. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, yeah. after the Gutobi, you get, it, you get the opportunity. You get the opportunity after the Gutobi. It's from the public. Amid the rowdy session, the Minister of Labor excuses himself with the permission of the Speaker. When the dust settles, the head of service comments on what she describes as rampant employment in the universities, while the speaker appeals to ASU for a compromise. The DG budget is always sitting on my head when it is time to pay salaries, because they keep borrowing to pay salaries. The bulk of the personnel cost that government pays goes to tertiary institutions. The white paper we told you will get the letter is here, I just showed it, I just waved it. It's now waiting for the uh, president's uh, final approval on the revitalization, revitalization fund. If this is the enabling environment you're trying to get to and you're here, and you cannot get to here now, but you can get to here now, to the middle, let's take it and continue to work towards getting to that final destination. The leadership of the House is hopeful that this may be the final meeting on the ASU strike before meeting the President and appeals to ASU and the government to accept the outcome for the benefit of Nigerian students. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. Power outages are not strange in Nigeria, with many resorting to alternative energy sources. A member of the members of the House of Representatives were treated to this sad reality during the sitting, forcing them to adjourn plenary. The outage, which occurred about two hours into plenary, lasted a few minutes, but the lawmakers were unable to continue with the sitting. It's the first plenary session of the week in the House of Representatives. Before getting down to the business of the day, lawmakers consider and adopt a motion of urgent national importance on the need for the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing to ensure immediate resumption of reconstruction of the Abuja Kaduna Expressway. Worried that the situation on the Abuja Kaduna Highway has become a drawback for the Nigerian economy, that if not immediately rectified, spills dumb 
for the economy and social life of Nigerians, contrary to Section 15, Subsection 1 of the Constitution, which mandates the Nigerian state to provide adequate facilities for and encourage free mobility of people, goods, and services. The House resolved to call on the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing to urgently and without further delay direct the contractor, Julius Berger PLC, to immediately return to the site and complete its constru reconstruction works, starting with the Jere Kaduna stretch. Some bills are then passed through second reading, which include the National Religious Harmony Commission Establishment Bill to provide a statutory framework for the protection of fundamental human rights of Nigerians as it relates to matters of religious freedom and liberty. The bill, among other things, seeks to provide an early warning system for government and law enforcement to detect and prevent actions liable to incite religious violence and break down in law and order. Also passed through second reading is the Employees on Paid Wages Prohibition Bill, which seeks to ensure the timely remuneration of employees, whether in the public or private sector, and improve the general welfare conditions of employment for labor in the country. Both bills were sponsored by the Speaker and some other members. As plenary progresses, lawmakers are plunged into darkness. After a few minutes in the darkness, the Speaker calls for adjournment and lawmakers exit the chamber using their phone torchlights. Terry Ikumi, Channels Television News. And uh, African leaders may have signed the Continental Free Trade Agreement for economic collabora collaboration, uh, but President Mohamed Buhari says the treaty will not work until there is business, political and security integration on the continent. The President was speaking at the second African Sub-Sovereign Governments uh, Network Conference hosted by the Nigeria's Governors, uh, Governors Forum at the Presidential Villa in Abuja. Take a listen. It's the signature tune of the Guards Brigade Band, signaling the arrival of President Mohamed Bouhari at the banquet hall of the Presidential Villa. He is in company of Mr. Kaide Faemi at the Second African Sub Sovereign Government Network Conference. Mr. Faemi, who is performing his last major function as governor of Ekiti State and chairman of the Nigeria Governors Forum before bowing out in two weeks, insists that subnationals can tap into the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement has provided us with an opportunity to deepen intra-African trade by promoting a liberalized market that permits freer flow of capital, goods, services, and our people. As subnationals with a huge potential for intra-regional trade, I know that all of us here stand ready to make this dream a reality. Mr. Benedict Orama, the president of Afrexim Bank, partners of the NGF for the event, say the bank will be spending about 40 billion US dollars in the next five years to ensure the success of AFTA. For the foregoing, it is clear to us why we must put our hands together to ensure the success of the AFCFTA. And that's why Afrexim Bank is doing is bit to make sure that this happens. We've disbursed over $20 billion in the past five years to support intra-African trade. And we plan to do $40 billion in the next five years. As President Mohamed Dubari promises full support of his administration to the successful implementation of AFTA, he advises on issues to be addressed to ensure the agreement succeeds. We have to understand that if this new drive towards a continental free trade area is to succeed, we must demonstrate a higher level of commitment to tackle eh, the slow pace of physical integration due to geographic and political fragmentations, B, the phase of political cooperation, and C, difficult tariff and non-tariff barriers that inhibit business integration. In this regard, in May this year, at the African Union Extraordinary Summit in Malabo, I backed the recommendation 
of the African Union Commission to set up a standby force on terrorism on the continent. One of the takeaways of the event is the recommendation that for subnationals to successfully tap into AFTA, they must strengthen their export value chain, which raises another key aspect of several outstanding issues to be addressed in the country. And for the third time this year, the Central Bank of Nigeria has raised interest rates from 14% uh, to 15.5%. And the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Mr. Godwin Emefele, while justifying uh, the raise, explains that the decision will help consolidate the impact of the last two policy rate hikes by the CBN. Last month, the annual inflation rate climbed to a 17-year high of 20.5% as the high cost of food items continue to affect citizens. After two days of meeting behind closed doors, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria is leading members of the Monetary Policy Committee to address Nigerians on his key decisions. The central bank governor starts the meeting with a look at how events in the international market are affecting the domestic market, leading to the bank's intervention in the real sector, rising to 9 trillion naira in three years. While the agriculture and manufacturing sector receives 66 billion naira in two months, its export facilitation program received the boost of 93 billion naira. In the last three years, the CBN had injected over 9 trillion naira into the economy, in addition to offering two-year moratorium for 10-year long-term loan facilities. The committee believed that these interventions have significantly helped to engender growth. However, in light of the persistent pressures of inflation, committee encouraged the bank to maintain a close watch on the inflationary implications of these inter interventions. The committee then raised the interest rate to 15.5% and the cash reserve ratio to 32.5% after consideration by committee members. However, it comes with a caution for commercial banks. As long as we see inflation trending upwards, that I cannot or that MPC cannot give any assurance to anybody that we will not continue to raise rates because we've seen rates move recently very, very aggressively. And that is the reason we are following it up in the May, in the July, and now the September meeting very aggressively for us to ensure to see to what can be done to rein in inflation. The committee also considered the intervention to clear the backlog of debts owed airlines. Yes, we will do everything possible and we are determined to clear the backlog and we will at, um, consistently at all the retail interventions as long as the accounts of the banks are funded, we will continue to make the releases to ensure that the, the, the cumulative backlog is cleared. We would like to appeal to the countries where the foreign airlines are domiciled or where their flights originate, that they should please, and we please, please beg them to give Nigerian airlines also a chance to land their aircrafts in their countries. This is the third time the Central Bank of Nigeria is increasing its monetary policy rate in 2022, as the bank insists on an economic stability plan that is responsive to Nigeria's economic growth. Our news round ends in Florida, where at least 21 people are believed to have died in Hurricane Ian and uh, more than 2 million homes and businesses in the state were without power one day after the hurricane uh, barreled through the state. Emergency crews are scrambling to reach trapped residents along the state's Gulf Coast as a resurgent Hurricane Ian uh, veered toward the Carolinas after cutting a path of destruction across Florida, leaving behind deadly floodwaters downed power lines and widespread damage. We have 12 unconfirmed fatalities in uh, Charlotte County. We have eight unconfirmed fatalities in Collier County. We have one confirmed fatality in, um, in Polk County. So that brings us up to 21 total. We do have an identified situation uh, that was done during the hasty search um, of, of some fatalities. Um, we do not know exactly how many were in the house. And, and let me paint the picture for you. The water was up over the rooftop, right? But we had a Coast Guard rescue swimmer swim down into it, and he could identify that it appeared to be 
uh, human remains. We do not know exactly how many. We do not know what the situation is. And before we comment on that, we, you know, we want to be transparent, but we just don't know that number. And we got a couple of other situations where we had that particular type situation. So everything that I want to talk about right now is about that search, secure, and stabilize. So we continue to have uh, our fire uh, rescue partners, search and rescue, going in there and uh, conducting the, uh, what we call the hasty search, and then they're coming back and do their primary search, and then they'll do a secondary search. So uh, again, I think it's very important for everybody to know that as a part of the search and rescue element, over a 72-hour period, there's actually three searches that are conducted. That hasty search is just very quick, see if they see any uh, survivors that are alive or in a traumatic situation, and they start to move those individuals to safety. That's been conducted. Now we're back in that primary search area, which is now we're doing a little more detailed search, and then we'll do a second search behind that. And that's News Round. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye for now.